Few names are etched into the bedrock of history, stitched into the very fabric of the multiverse. Names that when spoken, evoke fear, reverence, and legacy. Beings whose deeds are legendary, and who command earth-shaking power to both create and destroy. Their valor is enough to save entire planes, and their hubris enough to condemn others to cold oblivion. In the maelstrom of the blind eternities where tales of heroism and villainy spread to ears across infinite planes, one name rises above the chorus, above all else, and reverberates through the multiverse. Urza Planeswalker Hey lore lovers, my name's Eric and welcome to the Lorebarians YouTube channel, where we share the lore and stories behind many fantasy settings to strengthen the connection between people and their passions. Today's video covers a topic that many have asked for, and I'm happy to have finally delivered. We'll be discussing the story of Urza Planeswalker, from his humble beginnings as a Teresian artificer, to his ascension as a Planeswalker, to his master plans for Phyrexia's invasion and his ultimate legacy. I want to preface this by saying that this is Urza's story, and although his life has crossed or impacted several others, I will keep our focus on him. To keep our narrative from wandering, I won't delve too deeply into side stories or other arcs for characters that weren't their own videos. But before we begin, I want to give a huge thanks to all of my Patreon supporters. Their patronage means the world to me and helps the channel grow and improve. Alright, time to pour through ancient tomes and visit war-torn realms as we uncover the truth of Urza Planeswalker. Let's dive in. To say that Urza is integral to the history of the multiverse is a gross understatement. To fully appreciate his significance, one need only look at the timeline of Magic the Gathering, whose dates are commonly marked in our Gaivian Reckoning and given in reference to the year of his birth, or 0 AR. Furthermore, his nearly 4,300 year lifespan shaped Dominaria and other planes of the multiverse, significantly altering their paths and futures. But just as Urza is deeply tied to Dominaria, so too is the plane a part of him, and it's his strong desire for its protection that pushes him to action on his most memorable task, a millennia-long war with the artificial plane of Phyrexia as it attempts to invade Dominaria. But who exactly is this larger-than-life character? Urza is a planeswalker, a being capable of traversing the space between realms. He existed in the time before the Great Mending, when planeswalkers held near limitless power, including immortality, the ability to change their physical makeup at a whim, the strength to create new planes, among many others. In essence, planeswalkers were godlike beings held in check only by one another and by the limits of their own ingenuity. Urza was a human before his ascension, and he retained much of his characteristic appearance. A man weathered by age with ashen blonde hair, often with a beard. He carries with him a powerful staff that channels and amplifies his own energies, and is outfitted with several weapons of artifice. Urza's hallmark are his glistening gemstone eyes. They are the Might Stone and Weak Stone, two halves of an ancient Thran power stone that held within it the latent planeswalker essence of Glacian of the Thran. It's this fact that has led many to speculate as to whether Urza has his own spark or merely ignited the one held within his eyes. Regardless, their piercing and Urza's gaze unsettled many with whom he dealt. Urza's cold and calculating. In his mortal life he was an artificer of great renown, with a penchant for losing himself within his experiments and creations. Awkward in conversation and solitary in nature, he's always chosen the company of metal and wasn't overly affectionate towards others. But whenever a spark of creativity ignited his passion, Urza was moved to joyful action, spending weeks on end in his workshops seeking perfection. Urza's genius is on display in artificial creations such as the Titan engines with which he waged war on Phyrexia, seen in the card Void, the Silver Golem Karn, and the Temporal Aperture he used to travel through time, and the Skyship Weatherlight that acted as foundation for the legacy in Heroes of the Phyrexian Invasion. It's his desire for knowledge and his love of artificial contemplation that grants Urza a deep center in blue mana. As a planeswalker and one of the strongest ever known, Urza has access to all colors of mana. Through his millennia of travels, he gained mastery over white mana next, then black and red followed shortly after. Although Urza can wield green mana as well as any shaman or naturalist, the foundation of green is strongly opposed to his preference for artifice and technology. Through his Planeswalker Spark and his ability to control all five colors of mana, Urza commanded earth-shaking powers that allowed him to wage his crusade against Yagmoth and the Phyrexians. But he wasn't always heralded as the savior of Dominaria. Urza's grand powers and hundreds of lifetimes further separated him from others. He could no longer comprehend what it meant to be mortal, to be human. 
to share connection with another being and quickly lost touch with reality. He's often depicted as caring little for trifles of other people and even other planes. Generations and lives are insignificant to an immortal god. Yagmoth's corruption of his mind hastened Urza's descent into madness, which gripped him for millennia, and his apathy led to moral friction between him and other characters. We can read this in the flavor text of cards like Gainsay, in which a fellow planeswalker denounces Urza and states, I'd be happy to stop contradicting you, Urza, just as soon as you start being right. And again in the card Opposition, the Master Wizard Baron questions Urza's mental stability. Urza's fight against Phyrexia shows how single-minded he can be towards a cause, much to the detriment of his own life and the lives of those around him. He sees others as an exhaustible resource to be used whenever necessary. We can hear this in the flavor text of the card Extruder, which states, As the invasion drew closer, Urza's means began to resemble Phyrexia's ends. Urza's remembered throughout the ages as many things, but his saga and crusade against the forces of Phyrexia are often convoluted or misunderstood by Dominarians of the current day. To fully appreciate the story of Urza Planeswalker, we must journey to its beginnings and travel over 4,500 years into the past. Urza was born on the first day of the year 0AR to an aristocratic family of middling wealth in the eastern country of Argive on the continent of Terracier. For much of his youth he shared companionship with his brother Mishra, who was born on the last day of the same year. Though they were technically the same age, this gap resulted in contention and competition between the boys for superiority. As the two grew, Urza developed a reserved and awkward personality, while Mishra preferred action in attempts to outdo his brother. Urza's mother died when he was quite young, and by the time he turned 10, his father also passed. The two boys were sent to study archaeology and artifice with Tokasia, a longtime friend of their father's in the desert surrounding the Kara Ridges inland from their Argivan home. Many aristocratic families sent their youth to Tokasia's archaeological camp for a season or two before returning them to Argive. There they ventured into dig sites and uncovered several artifacts from the Thran an ancient and technologically advanced race whose civilization collapsed under unknown circumstances. With no place to call home and no one but each other to call family, the brothers remained with the artificer for several years. Both quickly became fascinated with Thran civilization and the wonders they created, but while Urza sought to tinker with metal salvage and schematics in the camp's confines, Mishra preferred the invigoration brought by toiling in the desert and plumbing the dig sites directly alongside members of the nomadic desert tribes of the Falaji. The brothers' appreciation for artifice flourished under the guidance of their master Tokasia, who imparted several lessons onto them about the nature of technology, energy, and invention. Her words would continue to echo throughout their minds as they grew into men, and she's referenced in the flavor text of several cards, including Onulet and Grapeshot Catapult, which illustrate her own mastery over metal as she's credited with inventing these constructs. Urza and Mishra uncovered several Thran ruins and used the civilization's knowledge to further expand upon their own significant advancements. Urza drafted blueprints and crafted the Ornithopter, a piloted device capable of flight. Perhaps greater was the discovery of power stones, devices that collected and stored mana, in essence fuel cells that could power the brothers' increasingly elaborate artifacts. Urza and Mishra took to the skies in their ornithopter and from their vantage point discovered countless more Thran ruins, expediting the archaeological dig. They also discovered a pattern emerging in the salvage zones and dig sites, one that centered around a particular location within the caves of Koilos. They surmised this location held special significance to the Thran, and journeyed to the caves with Tokasia. It's here the brothers made a fateful discovery that would forever alter their destinies. Unknown to all, the caves housed a planar portal connecting Dominaria to the artificial plane of Phyrexia that had been sealed off by the Thran during the fall of their great empire roughly 5,000 years ago. Phyrexia was a metal paradise intended to house Thran afflicted with disease, but the chief physician Yagmoth had more sinister motivations, transforming it into a world of his own design where he ruled as a god. The portal's lock was a unique power stone split in two. As long as the halves remained joined, the plane was safe from Phyrexia's horrors. The trio descended into Koilos' cavern network and happened upon an antechamber that housed many artifacts. On the central pedestal sat the Power Stone Lock. Urza and Mishra were each caught in a daze, drawn to the glistening Power Stone and hearing voices urging them to take it from the pedestal. The brothers reached for the stone at the same moment, 
and the next, a brilliant flash of energy erupted and sent Urza and Mishra flying. When the young men came to, each was holding one half of the Power Stone. The seal on Phyrexia had been undone, and the planar portal no longer locked Dominaria from the artificial plane. Unaware of the consequences of their actions, the brothers returned with their prize and sought to discover its purpose or meaning. Each half had different powers. Urza's acted as a source of strength, amplifying the power of objects around it, while Mishra's had the opposite effect, sapping power away. Urza named his the Might Stone, while Mishra's became known as the Weak Stone. Their opposing dichotomy is on display in the abilities of their cards. The Might Stone grants a plus one buff, while the Weak Stone gives a minus one. The flavor text of the cards relates the brother's discovery. While exploring the sacred cave of Koilos with his brother Mishra and their master Tokasia, Urza fell behind in the Hall of Tagsin, where he discovered the remarkable Might Stone. And, during the brother's childhood, Tokasia took them to explore the sacred cave of Koilos. There, in the Hall of Tagsin, Mishra discovered the mysterious Weak Stone. As Tokasia's archaeological dig continued, the brothers became increasingly suspicious of one another and each desired the other half of the shared stone, straining their tenuous relationship and driving them further apart. Urza and Mishra's jealousy teetered on the brink of obsession and came to a head in roughly 20 AR when an argument between them turned into a fight to obtain the other stone. Urza used the Might Stone against Mishra and his younger brother struck back with the Weak Stone. With dangerous energy swirling around their tent, Tokasia attempted to stop the quarrel, but she was caught in an exchange of mystical blows and was killed. Each brother was despondent in anguish over the loss of their tutor, someone they had grown to consider family over the decade of her company. Urza and Mishra blamed each other for her death, and the rift between them grew into a chasm. Thus began a conflict and competition to possess the two halves of the Power Stone that would last decades, pit brother against brother, and reduce much of Tercier to ash. The seed for the Brothers' War had been planted. Leaving his brother and the dust of the dig sites behind, Urza travels to the southern kingdom of Yosha alongside the coast and takes up residence as a clockmaker's apprentice and metal spinner within the capital city of Krug, honing his skills in artifice. News spreads throughout the vibrant city of the Warlord's Decree. The ruler of Yosha issues a challenge for any man within his kingdom. The one who can move an enormous jade idol will earn the right to be wed to his daughter, Caleb bin Krug, and become part of the royal family. The challenge sparks Urza's interest not out of a desire to marry into the royal household, but because he spots an ancient Thran tome within the dowry, from which he could glean untold knowledge. While many men more powerful than Urza try and fail to lift the statue with raw strength alone, Urza relies on his creative genius and skill in construction to build an artificial machine to transport the stone with ease. This act of ingenuity earns him the hand of Caleb and Krug, the Thran Tome, and the position of chief artificer for the kingdom of Yosha. With untold wealth and resources at his disposal, Urza dives headlong into his craft, often leaving the company of his wife for weeks as he compulsively experiments within his labs. He perfects the Ornithopter and creates several other artifacts to develop Yosha's military and assist the people of Krug, which we can see in the card Amulet of Krug. Urza's growing notoriety as a master artificer attracts aspiring tinkerers from across the kingdom, including Thanos, who wins Urza's favor with a display of his animal-inspired artifacts. Urza realizes Thanos' potential and takes the man under his wing to help advance the kingdom's school of artifice further. While Urza builds his own reputation in Yosha, Mishra wanders the desert of inland Tercier and is haunted by nightmares of Tokasia's death, of darkness and a world of metal. The weak stone whispers to him and draws Mishra back towards the planar portal at Koilos, but before he can reach his destination, the artificer is intercepted by a band of Halaji, desert nomads and warrior clans that thrive in the hostile desert environs. The band is a member of the Sawardi tribe, a militant faction within the Falaji. They enslave Mishra and take the weak stone into their possession. He spends several months laboring under the hot sun until a member of the tribe recognizes him as one of Tokasha's pupils and convinces the Kadir of the tribe to elevate Mishra to the rank of Rakik. He acts as mentor for the Kadir's son and imparts knowledge of artifice, language, and culture on the impressionable youth. But Mishra continues to be dogged by terrible dreams altered by the weak stone, visions of a dark metal world, the artificial world of Phyrexia. One night, his dreams startle him awake and Mishra comes to realize that the tribe is under attack from a massive, predatory beast of metal 
that arose from the desert sands. In the bedlam of the assault, with tribesmen dying all around, Mishra is reunited with the Weakstone and attempts to use the artifact's power to subdue the monster. Instead, the man discovers that this stone grants him control over the monstrosity, a beast of artifice born of Phyrexia and called a dragon engine, perhaps pulled from his dreams or dormant under the earth for millennia. What is certain is that with the dragon engine under his control, Mishra is seen as a leader in dangerous force. He rises to the level of Raki, or wizard, under the Kadir, and uses his beasts of war to subdue the rest of the Falaji tribes and unite them under the Sawardi. With power consolidated and the full might of a united Falaji and the strength of the dragon engine behind him, Mishra continues his march west towards conquest by assaulting the cities of Tomakul and Zagan. His siege of Zagan grinds to a halt when it's revealed the defenders have several artificial staves that drain the dragon engine's power and prevent Mishra from destroying their fortifications. This is seen in the card Staff of Zagan, whose flavor text tells us of Mishra's first meeting with the artificer and sadistic scientist Ashnod, and reads, Though Mishra was impressed by the staves Ashnod had created for Zagan's defense, he understood they only hinted at her full potential. Mishra takes Ashnod on as his own apprentice, like Urza had with Thanos, and she supplies him with several ingenious creations throughout the Brothers' War. She quickly builds her own reputation for being a cruel experimenter, often using human subjects for heinous tests to perfect her designs, seen in the card Ashnod's Altar. With Mishra's dreams of westward expansion momentarily satisfied, he turns his gaze towards the southern end of Falaji territory to an area of contention between the desert nomads and the warlord of Krug. Both peoples claim the sword marches or Suwardi marches in Falaji as ancestral territory of their people and the region is a hotbed of geopolitical friction where many border disputes and skirmishes transpire. Mishra convinces the Kadir to bolster Falaji forces within the region which is seen as a declaration of war by the warlord of Krug. Battles commence and Urza hears word of his brother for the first time in many years and he's hit with a pang of grief and a flicker of hope that they might put aside their differences. The simmering resentment between Urza and Mishra continues to boil as both join their respective leaders at a peace summit hosted by the nation state of Corlys in their settlement of Corlinda to reach an agreement and end fighting over the disputed sword marches. Tension dances on the knife's edge as both the warlord of Krug and the Falaji Kadir sense potential traps or backstabbings, and so have several forces in hiding that await their signal to strike. For Urza and Mishra, it's the first time they meet face to face since Tokasia's death. Their reunion's awkward, as both tentatively reach out to see if they can cross the ever-expanding chasm between another. Any dream of reconciliation between Urza and Mishra, or between Yosha and the Falaji is shattered, when the peace talks devolve and Krug's warlord launches ornithopter strikes against the gathered Falaji. As explosions rock the camp, the Kadir kills the warlord of Yosha, and the brothers are once again separated. Mishra sees this as sabotage by Urza's hands, believing his brother wants nothing more than his weak stone. The failed summit at Korlinda conflagrates Urza and Mishra's feud, which had for so many years been forgotten, into all-out war as both retreat to their respective capitals and prepare for battle. With the warlord slain, Urza becomes the leader of Yosha, and Mishra, in all intents and purposes, is the steward of the Falaji tribes. As armies girded for war, one last attempt at peace is made when Mishra visits the capital of Krug. Though suspicious and hesitant, the meeting is at least peaceful, until in the deep hours of the night, Mishra seduces Urza's wife as a hidden strike team of Falaji warriors infiltrates the sleeping city. The meeting was but a ruse, and Mishra attempts to abscond with the Power Stone and Urza's wife, his envy driving him to take everything from his brother. Urza discovers his brother's ploy and intercepts Mishra, but he escapes Urza's chambers. Though the High Artificer retains the Might Stone, the Falaji attackers begin a massacre of Krug, burning homes, looting caches, and slaughtering citizens. By the time the warning bells ring out, it's too late. The walls are destroyed by Mishra's dragon engines, and the city is overrun by thousands of desert warriors. Urza scrambles to deploy squadrons of ornithopters and his latest inventions of artifice, mechanical warriors called the Ocean Soldiers, but all they can do is ensure a safe corridor for fleeing refugees. The glistening capital of Yosha is burned to the ground in the biggest battle of the Brothers' War to date. The terrible dragon engines and the destruction they caused are depicted in the art and title of the card, Traxos, Scourge of Krug. In the flavor text of Dragon Engine, we hear of Krug's fate. Those who believed the city of Krug would never fall to Mishra's forces severely underestimated 
the might of his war machines. In 27 AR, the sacking of Yosha's capital signals an escalation in the war and the failings of diplomacy. Urza sees this as a personal attack and will be satisfied with nothing less than blood. The Brothers' War consumes Terciere for nearly four decades, ravaging the landscape as each side continues to manufacture more devastating weapons of artifice. Urza shores up an eastern alliance between Argive and the neighboring Corlys, presenting a stalwart and united front against Mishra. The Artificer of Yosha becomes the Lord Protector of the Alliance and de facto ruler of the kingdoms, while Mishra becomes the Qadir of the Sawardi, as Falaji continued to capture independent nation-states. Urza develops an extensive network of fortified towers and castles, erecting hundreds while exhausting natural resources and despoiling the land. We see his weapons of war in cards like Urza's Avenger, Urza's Mine, and Urza's Tower. During this time, Caleb and Krug bears Urza a child, a boy he names Harbin, who over the course of the war performs several reconnaissance missions for his father. Mishra's forces, meanwhile, are bolstered through the inventions of Ashnod, who creates the vile Transmigrant, a combination of man and machine that does not think or feel, only obey. As the brothers' forces continue battling one another, a small group of free-thinking and pacifistic ideologues, known as the Third Path, wish to see an end to the war before it devastates all of Terciere. They come into possession of the Golgothian Silex, an ancient artifact of unknown origin that they believe has the potential to unleash terrible power. The device could end the Brothers' War if deployed at the right moment. Unknown to either brother, both camps are infiltrated by Phyrexian agents acting through the Brotherhood of Gix. Gix, a demon from the artificial plane, arrives on Dominaria through the planar portal opened in Koilos and surveys the landscape. Surmising that Mishra and Urza present the greatest obstacle if the Phyrexians were to invade and capture Dominaria. He sends disciples to manipulate the Warring Brothers so they might destroy another. As the war reaches its final years, Mishra suffers from pneumonia-like symptoms and both his mind and body become feeble. The priests of Gix drive a wedge between him and Ashnod. She's banished and the worshippers corrupt his thoughts further until he's eventually turned over to the Phyrexians. Gix then lures Urza's and Mishra's armies to the island of Argoth for a final confrontation. Argoth is unexplored and untouched by war, a verdant isle deeply connected to Gaia, a goddess of nature, where all species work in harmonious reverence to their deity. But the arrival of the brothers signals the destruction of such natural beauty, as each harvests its resources to fuel their war machines. We see this in the art and flavor text of the card Mishra's Helix which shows a deforested Argoth and reads, The Helix was the finest example of Mishra's campaign strategy. If he couldn't have Argoth, no one could. The Brothers' War culminates in epic confrontation during the Battle of Argoth, as decades of technological advancements and innovations are launched from both sides. Man and machines fight as one and against another. Thousands perish as explosions crack the very earth beneath each army's feet. Shortly before each side takes to the field, Ashnod meets with Thanos. She has with her the Golgothian Silex, and after seeing what had become of her old master, wishes for Urza to use it to defeat his brother. Urza joins the fray with the Silex in his possession, and seeks out Mishra through the violence. The two confront another, and Urza, afraid he'll be unable to kill Mishra with whom he had once shared a fraternal bond, makes one last attempt at diplomacy. Urza realizes to his horror that his brother is no more that Mishra has been consumed by Phyrexia and transformed into a grotesque amalgamation of flesh and metal. This is on display in the art and flavor text of the card Retaliation, which show the pair's confrontation and reads, A foul metallic stench clogged Urza's senses. It was then he knew his brother was no more. Remorse, guilt, and shock surge through Urza's mind as he blames himself for Mishra's downfall. Greater still, he blames Phyrexia. Grief consumes him, and he channels the bursting emotions into the Golgothian Silex. With it, he unleashes a devastating shockwave of pure mana that washes over the battlefield. The Brothers' War ends in the year 64 AR with a Silex blast. Both armies are wiped from existence, Argoth is obliterated, and the shockwave extends for several miles in all directions. This moment is immortalized in the card Urza's Ruinous Blast. The illustration depicts the moment Urza activates it, and the flavor text reads, Centuries ago, one man's vengeance plunged the world into ice and darkness. As for Urza, the trauma of the event ignites his planeswalker spark. 
His Might Stone and Mishra's Weak Stone are united once more, and they become the Planeswalker's eyes. Spared from death, Urza walks from Dominaria and leaves a legacy of destruction. The repercussions of the Brothers' War and Silex Blast are far-reaching in both space and time. Chiefly, Urza's detonation of the Silex ignited his spark as he ascended to the status of all-powerful Planeswalker. But unforeseen consequences ripple through the multiverse as Urza's Blast began the formative process of the Shard of Twelve Worlds. The creation of a metaphysical bubble around twelve planes which prevented travel either into or out of them, essentially protecting Dominara from Phyrexia's reach. This shard would take several centuries to completely materialize. More locally, the energy of the Silex Blast destroyed the island of Argoth, roiled the surrounding seas, and devastated many of the provinces of Terrasier. Its fallout significantly altered Dominaria's weather pattern and brought about the Time of Ice, which would last from 64 AR to roughly 3000 AR, making Urza responsible for the plane's technological stagnation and descent into an ice age. While Urza is free to walk the planes and leave behind his mistakes, the rest of Dominaria attempts to gather its shattered pieces and rebuild. The Planeswalker's legacy is frozen within the expanding glaciers of a cooling plane. Centuries after his departure, celebrated arcanists and archaeologists from Soldevi and elsewhere chisel out the metallic remains of the Brothers' War, where they uncover both Urza's advanced technology and that of Phyrexia's. These discoveries bring forth a much-needed era of enlightenment to the intellectually decayed Dominaria, as mages unlock the secrets of the past. Cards like Urza's Bobble and Urza's Engine showcase some of the Lord High Artificer's recovered devices, while the flavor text of the card Word of Undoing illustrates how others use Urza's accrued knowledge. It reads, It was in Urza's journals that I finally found the secret at the core of the summoning. But not all discoveries are as benign, nor are all artifacts of Urza's creation. Archaeologists also uncovered derelict Phyrexian war machines slumbering under the ice. If awakened, they could easily destroy the small villages and nations fighting for meager existence during the Ice Age. Discord sown between Hydar, master of the Rhymewind, who seeks to tap into Phyrexian technology and activate the slumbering machines, and Arkham Daxon of the Soldevi, who knows that artifice sundered Dominaria once already and is hesitant to stir Phyrexia. The flavor text of Mishra's Bobble highlights Hydar's position as he states, Arkham's a babbling fool. Phyrexian technology is our greatest blessing. Take this delightful trinket, for instance. Though the Rhymewind activates several war machines, the frozen and dated Phyrexians, cut off from their leaders, prove unable to conquer Dominaria. The Ice Age is exemplary of Urza's power, his part in Dominaria's history, and how long a shadow the Great Planeswalker can cast. From his ascension to Planeswalker and the realization that Mishra was corrupted beyond redemption, the rest of Urza's life is consumed by a personal war with Phyrexia. Every scheme, invention, and discovery is directed towards a single goal, the obliteration of the artificial realm that threatens Dominaria's own existence. The first several centuries of Urza's new life as an immortal godlike being are marked by direct action as he vows vengeance for Mishra's death. He spends much time traveling the blind eternities in search of Phyrexia, and though he occasionally discovers and dispatches Phyrexian raiding parties on other planes, he's unable to attain one of their planar portals or discovers the plane's location. The hunt bears little fruit until 1800 AR, or nearly 2000 years later, when he happens upon a Phyrexian newt named Zancha. Newts are creatures of flesh artificially born in the vats of Phyrexia, and intended to act as sleeper agents. Although their appearance is that of a human, they are completely obedient to the Phyrexian god Yagmoth, and are deployed in secret to destabilize other planes before Phyrexian soldiers invade. Unfortunately for Zancha, she possessed something few others on Phyrexia do self-determination, and an ability to think for herself which is seen as a fatal flaw in a world where subservience is imperative. Urza Planeswalker saves Zancha's life when he intervenes as Phyrexian agents attempt to execute her. The defective Newt has knowledge that Urza desires, Phyrexia's location, and she offers to show him in exchange for protection against Yagmas agents. At once, Urza drafts schematics for a massive dragon engine with which to invade Phyrexia and finally avenge Mishra's death. A vindictive planeswalker, a Phyrexian fugitive, and a beast of metal make for a peculiar invasion party, but the trio nevertheless begin their assault on Phyrexia. Urza's confidence in his powers as a planeswalker and in his dragon engine verge on arrogance as he sets fire to the stinking world of metal and oil, scorching thousands of Phyrexians in his rage. 
Zancha, meanwhile, has her own purpose for returning to Phyrexia, and enters the chamber where the central power matrices of the newts are stored. Here, she retrieves what she considers her heart, seen in the art of the card ill-gotten gains, and the flavor text further elaborates. Urza thought it a crusade. Zancha knew it was a robbery. Although his strike takes Phyrexia by surprise, he tears through three of the nine spheres, Urza's progress stalls in the fourth sphere when he comes against Phyrexian demons and the essence of Yogmoth himself. The Planeswalker underestimated Phyrexia's might, and in his hubris Urza suffers a psychic attack by the Plains God, highlighted in the art and flavor text of Corrupt, which shows a tethered Urza succumbing to the mental assault and reads, Yogmoth brushed Urza's mind and Urza's world convulsed. Already in grief over the loss of Mishra and consumed by guilt, Yogmoth shatters Urza's mind which only hastens his descent into madness. The wounded planeswalker and Zancha retreat, bouncing along the plains until they land on Sarah's realm in the year 2500 AR. Sarah's realm, an artificial plane created by the eponymous walker, is a plane of pure white mana that allows the flame companions a moment of respite to heal their wounds. Sarah's remedies comfort Zancha, but Urza's trauma runs deeper than flesh, and the planeswalker's salves offer little. For five years, Urza lies in a dormant state to recover from his near-death brush with the Ogmoth, which is highlighted in the flavor text of the card Sanctum Custodian, which reads, Sarah told them to guard Urza as he healed. Five years they stood. Although his physical essence recovers, Yogmoth's curse continues to eat away at Urza's mental stability and hope, which we can see in the flavor text of two cards, Sicken and Pacifism. Sicken shows a despondent Urza and reads, Urza dared to attack Phyrexia. Slowly, it retaliated. While pacifism shows the planeswalker removing his power armor and reads, Fight? I cannot. I do not care if I live or die, so long as I can rest. Urza emerges from his convalescence with dire warnings. He's seen Phyrexia's capabilities of destruction and relates the threat to Sarah. He cautions Sarah to shore her own defenses. Phyrexian agents have tracked him across the multiverse, and his presence here will ultimately draw the Phyrexians to Sarah's realm. Urza and Zancha leave with their injuries and spirits on the mend while Sarah's realm suffers the first Phyrexian incursions, which will ultimately lead to the downfall of the plane. This is related to us in the Arden flavor text of Absolute Grace, which states, In pursuit of Urza, the Phyrexians sent countless foul legions into Sarah's realm. Though beaten back, they left it tainted with uncleansable evil. The Planeswalker and Phyrexian Newt travel next to the distant plain of Equilor, a realm steeped in mystery that resides on the very edge of time, and some believe to be the oldest plane in existence. Urza seeks knowledge of Phyrexia, knowledge that ancient Equilorians seem to possess. He receives several revelations from their cryptic elders, including the origins of Phyrexia. Urza learns that the Phyrexians were once Dominarians, and they desired to reclaim what once was theirs. More importantly, he learns of the Shard of Twelve Worlds he inadvertently created with a Silex Blast that prevents Phyrexians from reaching Dominaria. At first, he believes his crusade is over, that his plane is safe, and that it's out of Yagmoth's reach. But no sooner does he realize this than the Elders relate to him of the Shard's imminent destruction. He must return to Dominaria and prepare for Phyrexia's invasion. In roughly 3200 AR, over 3000 years since his fateful war with Mishra and the devastation of Tercier, Urza once more comes to the plane of his birth. Although Urza Planeswalker initiates stratagems to counteract the Phyrexian threat, he succumbs to the madness inflicted upon his mind by Yogmoth. His guilt over Mishra's death drives Urza into melancholic obsession. He loses sight of his true purpose and becomes distracted with penance. He makes increasingly bizarre attempts to bring his brother back from death, to heal the pain within his heart and be rid of the nightmares that plague him. This is much to the detriment of Dominaria. With its guardian preoccupied, the plane stands unguarded against Phyrexian sleeper agents that infiltrate and amass within heavily populated city centers. Zancha discovers sleepers have already fomented rebellion and discord across several provinces, but the news isn't enough to shock Urza from his stupor, so she deploys another tactic. The Newt finds a slave named Ratape, or Rat for short, who bears uncanny resemblance to Mishra and purchases his freedom on the stipulation that he act the part. Mishra's doppelganger forgives Urza's transgressions and absolves the planeswalker of his guilt, urging him to focus instead on the urgent Phyrexian threat. Rat and Zancha's words shake Urza from his madness, but not before the Phyrexian demon Gix, 
who was responsible for Mishra's fall over 3,000 years ago, emerges from Phyrexia with a small invasion force. We can see the horror of the demon's arrival in the ardent flavor text of Unnerve, which shows his gruesome shadow behind a shocked Sansha and reads, If fear is the only tool you have left, then you'll never control me. We can also see their despair on display in the illustration of the card Darkest Hour. The effects of Urza shirking his duties are immediately felt as many settlements are torn asunder by sleepers and Phyrexians alike. In this critical moment, Urza reveals his ingenuity and mastery over artifice when he quickly crafts hundreds of screaming spiders, artifacts that emit sound waves at a frequency intolerable to Phyrexians and has them planted throughout the sleeper-infested towns. With the immediate threat neutralized, Urza chases Gix to the caves of Koilos and confronts the demon believing his guilt can be lifted if he kills Mishra's tormentor. They lock in an arcane melee, and the raw power of Gix is displayed as the demon not only staves off blows from the godlike planeswalker but actually proves to be Urza's equal. Gix sees an opportunity to deploy a temporal rift to obliterate Urza, but his attack is thwarted when Zancha and Rad arrive. Instead, Gix is hurled through the portal, Zancha and Rad are killed, and Urza stands alone in the caves defending Dominaria from Phyrexia's first incursion in several millennia. The battle and Zantra's sacrifice are enough to bring Urza back to his senses, and the Planeswalker realizes how close Phyrexia is to launching a full-scale invasion. With thousands of contingency plans swirling through his mind, Urza gathers Zantra's Heartstone Matrix, an object by which he can remember his only companion in thousands of years, and one he might consider a friend. Mere minutes are precious to Urza, who realizes how little time he has to build defenses and resume his preparations. But perhaps time is the key to defeating Yawgmoth. Once more in control of his faculties and shaken from his stupor, Urza prepares Dominaria's defenses for the upcoming Phyrexian invasion. Alongside the Master Wizard Baron and several distinguished mages, Urza founds his academy on the remote Isle of Teleria in 3285 AR. A bastion of knowledge and experimentation, Urza uses the intellect of Dominaria's brightest to push the envelope on temporal manipulation. He reasons that Phyrexia is too great a foe for one being to defeat even a planeswalker, but if he can travel in time and prevent Yawgmoth's ascension, then perhaps he can save Dominaria from invasion. Urza is a legendary myth in Dominarian culture, so the planeswalker hides his identity under the pseudonym Master Malzra, his true name and power known only to Baron. Over several years, the two transformed Teleria into the central hub of Dominarian defenses, cultivating youthful genius, perfecting temporal experiments, and maintaining absolute secrecy to keep their intentions hidden from probing Phyrexian sleeper agents. Here they recruit the promising wizards Joyra and Teferi, two individuals whose destinies are entangled with Urza's and Baron's. After hundreds of failed experiments in temporal manipulation, Urza discovers that Silver can pass through his apparatus with relative ease. The breakthrough is showcased in the Arden flavor text of Stroke of Genius, which depicts Urza poring over several schematics and reads, After a hundred failed experiments, Urza was stunned to find that common silver passed through the portal undamaged. He immediately designed a golem made of the metal. Urza places Zancha's heartstone within his silver probe to make it self-sufficient and adaptable. This instead creates an artifact with consciousness and with a conscience. From his actions, the silver golem Karn is born. With time against him, Urza hastens his temporal experiments and sends Karn further and further through both space and time. His manipulations begin altering the time stream, and bizarre anomalies unfold across Teleria. Urza yet again shows his separation from morality and apathy towards other beings as he pushes his experiments further, unconcerned with the consequences. Baron frequently stands against Urza in an attempt to bring sense to the Planeswalker, which we can see in cards like Opposition, whose flavor text reads, Urza says he's sane, perhaps, but measures of sanity among planeswalkers are hard to come by. One night in 3307 AR, while the Tolarian Academy sleeps, Urza's nightmare is realized. Carrick, a Phyrexian sleeper agent posing as a castaway, washes ashore and is found by Joyra. He seduces the young mage and manipulates her into divulging information about Talaria, the Academy's defenses and its openings. Under the cover of darkness, Carrick guides Phyrexian negators into the academy where they slaughter the unsuspecting Dominarians. Much of the attack is witnessed through Karn's eyes as Joyra, Teferi, and most importantly Baron are killed. Years of planning are turned to ash as the Phyrexians assault the island. 
Though Urza accepts many setbacks, Baron's death is a loss he's unwilling to swallow, and he sends Karn back in time to stall the attack, if not prevent it entirely. But the temporal aperture is still a prototype, and Karn hasn't been sent so far into the past. The stress is too much for the device and the time stream to bear. The silver golem is pulled back to the present after injuring Carrick, and an instant later, the aperture explodes in a brilliant flash of light. The Talarian Academy is shredded as the time stream itself is ripped apart and reality destabilized from Urza's temporal experimentation. Thousands perish, hundreds more are missing, and pockets of extreme fast or slow time dot the island, a death sentence for anyone who wanders near. The extent of the damage is illustrated in the Art of the Cards Sunder and Karn's Temporal Sundering. In Sunder's text reads, The flow of time was disrupted, like a flooding river it rose from its banks. Teleria was drowned in an instant that stretched towards infinity. Urza's ploy saves Baron's life and much of his research but at great human and material cost, as most of the academy and its students are destroyed. The island must be abandoned for the time being. And though Urza's temporal manipulations thwarted the Phyrexian assault, Carrick and several negators remain on Talaria trapped within the crater of a fast time bubble. Urza Planeswalker returns to Talaria ten years after the tragic event, with Baron, Karn, and a new cohort of students, to reclaim the island and rebuild the academy. In a symbolic gesture of atonement, Urza erects a memorial for those who lost their lives those years ago, indicating the great Planeswalker is not above remorse, nor beyond the scope of human emotion. With Joyra's assistance, who has been surviving on the island the last 10 years, Urza and his new academy navigate the dangers of extreme time bubbles and actually use them to their advantage, performing weeks or months worth of research in little over a standard day. They also rescued Teferi from an extreme slow time bubble that he had been trapped within since the temporal eruption. By harnessing temporal anomalies, Urza finally has a means of leveling the field against Yagmoth's invasion that has had thousands of years to prepare. The Planeswalker's relief is short-lived, when Urza discovers Carrick's presence in the chasm of fast time. Though ten standard years have passed, the Phyrexian sleeper agent has experienced more than a century, time in which he's taken on the name Crick, son of Yagmoth, erected a fortress, constructed a spawning pit, and is constantly birthing new generations of negators and other abominations capable of withstanding the rending energy of passing through a time bubble, all in an effort to destroy Urza. Urza can't ready Dominaria's defenses while a threat lurks just under his nose, and so spends the next several years constructing artificial beasts and weapons with which to wage war against Kurik. While dropping several explosive salvos into the chasm, Urza's craft is struck by a Phyrexian bolt and the Planeswalker descends through the temporal barrier into Kurik's fast time lair. The Planeswalker must use most of his strength just to survive the journey, and although he beats back hundreds of Phyrexian minions, he's captured by Kurik. The Sleeper hoists Urza on a post within an arena where he intends to perform a slow and agonizing execution. Urza's helpless to resist as the Phyrexians continually slice, stab, and mutilate his body. All of his energy is directed at regenerating and maintaining his physical form. But just as Crick is about to deal a death blow, Karn and several squadrons of Seeker drones attack from above, shredding through Phyrexian flesh and metal alike. The Silver Golem saves his master, and the pair escape. Though Crick's vengeance is delayed, the Phyrexian remains in his fortress as a continuous threat. Urza Planeswalker realizes that he can't repel the Phyrexians using only the resources of his solitary isle, so he ventures across Dominaria seeking allies and raw materials to manufacture artificial legions. Through Joyra, he uncovers the Mana Rig, a derelict Thran forge hidden beneath layers of volcanic magma on the continent of Shiv. The Thran produced their metal, an extremely hard alloy that had a bizarre ability to grow, as well as power stones within the Mana Rig a treasure trove for Urza that's guarded by goblin hordes and the reptilian Viashino. After subduing Darigaz, the Viashino's dragon champion, the Planeswalker brokers a deal with the native races for access to the Mana Rig's secrets, even going so far as to offer Karn as a reward for their cooperation. It's here that Urza begins crafting a vessel of sleek design with quick maneuverability, an impressive payload, and the raw power to launch precise surprise strikes against the Phyrexians. He names it the Skyship Weatherlight, a dangerous tool against Yagmoth that is itself part of a greater weapon, one that Urza has been preparing for centuries. Weatherlight, Karn, Urza's own Power Stone eyes, and several other artifacts or people yet undiscovered are pieces of something more, 
They are Urza's legacy that when gathered together could tip the balance in the war against Phyrexia. The beauty in Weatherlight's design is its adaptability. The craft is constantly evolving and growing thanks to the Thran metal, but it's incomplete. Urza requires no mere wood for the hull, but something that will bind the metal sheets as one and grow alongside it. He departs for the sentient forest of Yavamaya to seek another ally against Karik and to request a fragment of Yavamaya's ancient Magnagoth trees. Urza Planeswalker is, however, an unwelcome guest in Yavamaya. The forest's memory is great, and it recalls Urza as a force of desolation, an artificer who defiled Gaia and destroyed the island of Argoth millennia ago. Multani, Yavamaya's avatar, imprisons Urza for his transgressions and subjects him to the torment and anguish he caused. Urza is forced to feel Argoth's pain during his destructive battle with Mishra to understand the agony he has caused Dominaria. For nearly four years, Urza remains a prisoner of Yavamaya, unable to form a coherent thought or planeswalk away. Meanwhile, Baron and Teleria's forces feel the constant pressure from Karik, as generations of breeding have created Phyrexian negators resistant to the shearing effects of fast time bubbles. They endlessly assault Talaria, probing for weaknesses and exhausting the defender's weapons or resources. Baron's desperation forces him to call on Urza through a summoning spell. After several attempts, the call is enough to shake Urza from his anguish and through his mental connection with Yavamaya, the forest realizes the true horrors of Phyrexia, despoilers of a far greater magnitude than the Planeswalker and with whom Urza has been embattled for centuries. Yavamaya forgives Urza of his past crimes and grants him the Weather Seed, the seed of the oldest Magnagoth tree in the very heart of the forest, to integrate into Weatherlight's hull. In 3360 AR, Urza returns to Teleria at the helm of a multinational and multiracial Dominarian force to save Baron from Karik's advances and repel the Phyrexians. This is the first of many instances where Urza's power, prestige, and machinations unite the distinct nations of Dominaria against a common foe. Dragons burn the earth Phyrexians stand upon, Viashino and goblins tear negators limb from limb, and elves, sprites, and nature itself shred artificial abominations as Urza's force relieves Baron's exhausted defenders. Dominaria's collective might is enough to obliterate Crick's legions, and the son of Yagmoth is himself defeated by Urza, who destroys the fortress as well as the breeding pits within the fast time bubble. After nearly six decades, the immediate Phyrexian danger is neutralized, but Urza's fight is far from finished. He unveils the Weatherlight and christens it with a maiden voyage to Sarah's artificial realm, again seeking allies in preparation for the future invasion. It's been nearly 1,000 years since the Planeswalker first visited the Plane of Everlasting Sun, inadvertently bringing it to the attention of Phyrexia. In those years, Sarah's realm has been battered by relentless Phyrexian assaults, corrupted by the introduction of black mana, and without its Planeswalker custodian, on a slow decline towards destabilization and planar collapse. All things that are made swiftly apparent to Urza as he, the Weatherlight, and a contingent of Dominarian fighters arrive on the crumbling world. Sarah's realm has been under the harsh stewardship of Radiant Archangel since the Planeswalker abandoned it shortly after Urza's first visit. Centuries of campaigning against unending Phyrexian incursions transformed Radiant into a stern, aggressive, and vindictive ruler who places the blame for her realm's death at Urza's feet. Her hatred towards the Planeswalker is felt in the flavor text of the card Knighthood, which reads, He has returned. He who brought the Dark Ones. He who poisoned our paradise. How shall we greet him? With swift and certain death. Radiant's hatred blinds her from Phyrexia's presence within her own court as her chief advisor is a sleeper agent. With her mind corrupted and clouded, Radiant turns against her own people and cleanses their ranks of illusory Phyrexians seen in the illustration of Radiant's judgment. While Urza pleads with the Archangel, the Weatherlight takes on board as many Saren refugees fleeing Phyrexians as can fit on the ship. But the vessel isn't yet finished. Plane shifting requires huge reserves of mana and stored energy. Weatherlight's engine is incapable of fueling the ship's demands in its current state and will need a source soon if it's to escape the realm's collapse. As Weatherlight's crew secures a landing zone, Urza deems the Angel beyond reason and locks Radiant in battle. Sarah's strongest Archangel isn't defeated so easily, and she actually gains the advantage on Urza. An opportunity arises, and she rips out the Planeswalker's Power Stone eyes. Urza had been near death in Crick's lair, and again the Walker's dying body is tossed aside. 
The Mightstone and Weakstone house Urza's Planeswalker Spark. Without its essence, he loses his godlike powers and immortality. The triumphant angel holds her trophy high and gazes upon the lustrous artifacts. The two halves have minds of their own, however, and urge Radiant to reunite them. As she brings the Power Stone shards together, a massive shockwave bursts forth and emanates through the chamber. Radiant is consumed in the flux of energy, but not before realizing her own corruption and transgressions against her people. We see this moment, immortalized in the art and flavor text, of Vindicate, where Radiant's final words are related. I am the Mad One. The Power Stones revive Urza and the Planeswalker returns to Weatherlight, weighed down with thousands of Saren refugees. The vessel takes flight as Radiant's corrupted army and Phyrexian abominations advance. With deep regret, but seeing no other alternative, Urza gathers the essence of Sarah's collapsing realm and places it within Weatherlight's engine. This is seen in the art and flavor text of Planar Collapse, which shows Urza casting his spell and reads, With heavy heart, Urza doused one world's light to rekindle another's. He forsakes Sarah's realm so that Dominaria might have a chance against Phyrexia. With this, Weatherlight is capable of plane shifting and returns to Dominaria with what remains of Sarah's people. Urza's fight against Crick and Radiant, though successful, forced Urza to reconsider his plans and the construction of his legacy weapon. Though many of the artifacts have been made or gathered, a vital component is missing, and Urza dedicates the next several centuries towards its distillation. What the legacy requires is a human component, a being that encapsulates everything it means to be a Dominarian, but also one that comprehends and appreciates Phyrexia. To this end, Urza initiates his Bloodlines project in roughly 3385 AR and unveils it to the Talarian Academy as an advanced experiment in genetic engineering to produce the perfect warriors in their fight against Phyrexia. Soon, much of the Academy and families across Dominaria participate in the Bloodlines project, with or without their knowledge. The fast and slow time bubbles dotting Talaria Isle allow Urza's students to make several generations of breakthroughs within a short span of standard time, or work on a project for standard time decades. A branch of the project is creation of the Metathran, genetically and magically enhanced super soldiers bred only for combat to be used as steadfast and expendable source of manpower in the upcoming Phyrexian invasion. We see their breeding referenced in illustration or flavor text of several cards including Thran Dynamo and Urza's Incubator, while Metathran Soldier relates their purpose and states, Just as Sarah crafted angels of light and faith, Urza constructed an army of sorcery and power to resist the coming invasion. Urza's Metathran breeding and the entirety of the Bloodline project isn't without its moral and ethical gray area. As the millennia-old Planeswalker grows more singularly focused on his fight against Phyrexia, those around him grow concerned over his actions. Baron's wife Rain condemns Urza's shallow attachment to life in the flavor text of Rescue. Urza, I've discovered more promising students than you and my husband have combined, and I haven't lost a single one. And mental discipline illustrates Baron's own difficulty in accepting the Planeswalker's actions. It reads, Baron drowned his doubts about Urza's project by delving ever deeper into its details. But it'd be unfair to judge Urza's dubious actions with such haste. He's one of the few people, if not the only person, to have first-hand experience with Phyrexia. Yes, others have witnessed Phyrexian incursions, but they've not seen the plan of abominations themselves. They've not felt the Ogmas' desire to consume all. They can't hope to comprehend the true threat Phyrexia poses, not just for Dominaria, but for the rest of the multiverse. From this perspective, one can begin to understand Urza's motivations and see the necessity of his actions. While Urza plans his legacy's bloodline, Phyrexia makes its own invasion preparations. Twice, small Phyrexian incursions through planar portals had been beaten back. To transport the full might of Phyrexia, Yagmoth's forces have something on a grander scale in mind. They create Wrath, an artificial plane made from bizarre flowstone to act as a staging ground. Flowstone is an extremely malleable substance created in the furnaces of Phyrexia's stronghold and used to continually add mass to Wrath, expanding the plane's borders and protecting it from the destructive effects of the blind eternities. The nature of Flowstone and the magical abilities of Wrath's Evanser would allow the artificial plane to completely phase atop Dominaria merging the two realms and allowing Phyrexia's invaders to directly launch assaults. While Urza purifies his bloodlines, Phyrexia tests Wrath's capabilities by launching small incursions into Dominaria, 
these skirmishes, which focus on areas of suspected Bloodlines project activity, the likes of Kel Diavamaya and Benalia, act as Phyrexia's own distillation of superior warriors as each defeat brings about further modification. Decades of incursions bring Phyrexia closer to perfection and invasion. Urza's time is running short, a sentiment he fully realizes in roughly 4013 AR, when he discovers the artificial plane of wrath and sees the countless thousands of Phyrexians preparing for war. He returns to Dominaria to oversee the final adjustments of his bloodline project as Phyrexians' incursions grow bolder. Croag himself, the current evincer of wrath, launches a sortie against the warrior clans of Keld. Here, they uncover a laboratory belonging to a rogue member of Urza's Telerian Academy, whose genetic experiments prove too heinous for the other wizards to digest. Urza feels Phyrexia's claws tightening their grip when in 4179 AR, the child of legacy is born as Gerard of Clan Capuchin in the nation of Benalia. Centuries of meticulous experimentation and genetic engineering have borne the last component of Urza's legacy weapon as the Planeswalker sends Korn to watch over the child. Though it's a moment of reprieve, Urza isn't allowed to rest as he continues overseeing Dominarian defenses. The ranks of his Metathran children swell and will soon prove quite effective on the battlefield as the first line of protection. Urza travels across and beyond Dominaria, seeking fellow planeswalkers to further bolster his plan's defense. With all his plans developed, with all his contingencies made, there is little else Urza planeswalker can do besides stand by for invasion, and Phyrexia doesn't make him wait long. Urza's millennia-long struggle and simmering resentment towards Phyrexia collide with Yogmoth's unflagging drive to consume all of Dominaria in 4205 AR with the Phyrexian invasion. God will strike God, light and freedom will be tested, and billions of lives both natural and artificial hang in the balance with the climactic battle of Urza Planeswalker's saga. Yogmoth's invasion unfolds in three major phases, the first of which sees advanced strike teams arrive via planar portals to secure strategic positions. This is illustrated in the art and flavor text of the card Planar Portal, which shows a Phyrexian gargantuan emerging from a tear in the sky and reads, The sky split, and the air crackled and roiled. The Phyrexian invasion of Dominaria had finally begun. Phyrexia's forces are led by the redoubtable general Tsabo Tabak, but this first stage is met with limited success. The card route shows Yagmoth's monstrosities destroying a besieged city, while Disrupt shows Urza and Teferi destroying one of the Planar Portals. Urza planes walks from conflict to conflict as war consumes all of Dominaria and surveys the global battlefield. His confidence in his schemes are highlighted in the art and flavor text of the card Well Laid Plans, which reads, I knew this day would come, said Urza. Looking at the destruction, bear inside. You don't have to revel in it. As the invasion unfolds, Urza joins the fray disguised as a mortal, known as the Blind Seer, to guide Gerard Capuchin and the rest of the Weatherlight crew. With Urza's assistance, Weatherlight confronts Tsabo Tavik at the Caves of Koilos, a location from which Yagmoth hopes to send more forces directly from Phyrexia. Gerard and Weatherlight lead a united Dominarian contingent and successfully defend the caves, killing Tavik and preventing the gate to Phyrexia from opening. A lull sweeps across Dominaria as the battered defenders regroup. Though they've staved off the first part of the invasion, much of Phyrexia's army waits in the wings for the second phase, the Wrathy Overlay. Wrath at this point has accrued enough matter and mass to match Dominaria, allowing the planes to overlap and merge with another. This spells disaster for the beleaguered Dominarians as Phyrexian numbers are bolstered with the Wrathy overlay. Abominations materialize on all sides and across all continents. There are no front lines or safe havens as the artificial plane merges with Dominaria and dumps thousands of Phyrexian soldiers. Urza launches the next phase of his own plans amidst the destruction and seeks allies willing to counter-strike by attacking Phyrexia directly. He reasons that if their god is destroyed, the Phyrexians will lose the will to fight. For such a dangerous gambit, Urza crafted massive and powerful artificial constructs, known as Titan Engines, equipped with a dazzling arsenal of destructive weaponry, including missiles, mana cannons, and bombs. Their impressive stature is illustrated in the card Power Armor. But a special pilot is required to command these Titan Engines, one with power far greater than any mortal. Urza gathers a team of planeswalkers to pilot the engines and join him in his assault of Phyrexia. Nine titans embark on the dangerous journey to Yagmoth's domain. Urza intended to recruit his one-time pupil and fellow planeswalker Teferi 
but the Zalfiran Chronomancer decided to save his people from slaughter by phasing his entire country out of the time stream. This is highlighted in the cards Teferi's Moat and Teferi's Protection. With his strike team gathered and his engines powered, Urza and the Titans retaliate by striking the heart of Phyrexia, while the bulk of its forces are distracted on Dominaria. Despite taking Yawgmoth by surprise, Phyrexia isn't without its defenders, and the Titans fight against staunch resistance as they work their way to the core of the world, obliterating the outer spheres in their wake. The cards Void and Searing Rays beautifully illustrate the Titan Engine Assault. Urza has equipped each Titan Engine with a destructive weapon of his own design, known as a Soul Bomb, that when set off will trigger a chain reaction and reduce Phyrexia to ash. Unfortunately, an explosive of such immeasurable destruction requires an equally powerful force to fuel it. The Soul Bombs require the sacrifice of a Planeswalker's life essence to unleash their maximum potential. Urza's moral justifications have always been considered dubious by others, but this type of forced suicide seems beyond even his measures. Until Tevish Zat, one of the Nine Titans, betrays the others and sides with Phyrexia going so far as to kill other members of the strike team. Urza uses Sot's betrayal as an opportunity to solve this moral dilemma of fueling the soul bombs. He reasons that Sot threatens all of Dominaria and perhaps the multiverse with his actions and should be eliminated. From the flavor text of Confound, it seems Urza recruited Tevish precisely for this reason. He states, Did I know Sot would betray us? Urza asked quizzically. I was counting on it. And in the illustration of the card Dark Suspicions, we see Urza take action. He kills Zat and uses the Planeswalker's essence to fuel the Master Soul Bomb. At last, with each Soul Bomb placed, Urza's triumph over Phyrexia is finally at hand. Dominaria is saved from its tormentor Yawgmoth. But as Urza makes his way further into Phyrexia, memories of the past long buried rise to the fore. Perhaps due to Yawgmoth's corruption thousands of years ago, or his own heavy conscience, Urza comes upon a likeness of Mishra, chained and tormented, seen in the art of the card, Urza's Guilt. Whether or not this is truly Mishra is up to speculation, but regardless, it gives Urza pause and forces him to reconsider his actions. The Titans stand in triumph over a doomed Phyrexia when the first soul bomb detonates, seen in the cards Implode and False Dawn. But Urza hesitates. He looks around and sees an artificial world of perfection replete with constructs and organisms to understand, and deeper truths to uncover. The Planeswalker has a crisis of faith in his moment of triumph. For the first time ever, Urza wonders if Phyrexia is worth saving. As an artificer, he can't wantonly destroy such brilliant artificial creations. And who could create perfection other than a supremely divine being? In one desperate moment, Urza dismantles the Master Soul Bomb. He betrays the Titans. He betrays the Weatherlight and Dominaria. But most importantly, he betrays his own convictions. Despondent, Urza Planeswalker submits himself to the majesty of Phyrexia. To prove Urza's loyalty to his new master, the Planeswalker is brought deep into Phyrexia's heart, where he must confront and slay the heir to the legacy. Gerard Cabochon has also pledged his allegiance to Yagmoth in exchange for the resurrection of Weatherlight's navigator Hannah, whom he had loved. A deep irony unfolds as the two mightiest defenders of Dominaria come to blows in the Phyrexian arena to win favor with the god they so despise. This irony is illustrated in the Ardent Flavor text of Warped Devotion, in which the two combatants prepare, and Urza tells Gerard, Before the glory of Yagmoth? Yes, even this makes sense. As the pair gird for ritual combat, Yagmoth strips Urza of much of his Planeswalker powers, and he's left to fend for himself with his own devices. Blades cross and spells sizzle, while thousands of machines roar at the spectacle in thunderous applause. Twice, Urza gains the advantage on Gerard and nearly kills him, which we can see in the illustration of the card's soul link. But Yagmoth intervenes stating that the Master Artificer used cowardly and indirect tactics against Capuchin. When their swords lower for a third time, Gerard manages to defeat the man to whom he owes his entire existence. Capuchin's swift strike beheads the Artificer, and Urza Planeswalker's lifeless body falls before the glory of Yagmoth. It seems his fight is over. Urza's crusade, his millennia-long defense of Dominaria and fight against Phyrexia is abruptly ended by the Legacy's heir. 
The victorious Gerard takes Urza's severed head as trophy and stands before Yagmoth to complete their bargain. The chilling appearance of Phyrexia's god is beautifully illustrated in the Art of the Card Yagmoth's file offering, where we see a reborn Hannah float tantalizingly close as Gerard carries Urza's head. But to Capuchin, Yagmoth fails his end of the bargain. The Hannah before him is a simulacrum, false creation rather than the true woman. Dissatisfied, Gerard betrays Yagmoth, escapes Phyrexia, and returns to Weatherlight to continue the fight with Urza's severed head in tow. The third and final stage of the invasion commences when Yagmoth, infuriated by the lack of progress and emboldened to forego subtlety, assumes the form of a massive cloud of darkness and death and arrives on Dominaria. The god's presence, his touch alone, is enough to kill, and billions of lives are lost as Yagmoth rolls across the plain. Preparations are hastily made aboard Weatherlight to channel pure white mana from Dominaria's Null Moon and incinerate Yagmoth in his death cloud form. Though the blast harms Phyrexia's god, it's not enough to destroy Yagmoth, and Dominaria sits on the brink of destruction. Capuchin and the crew are shocked when Urza's severed head begins addressing them. Though severely weakened, Urza's essence and spark are contained within his power stone eyes, and the planeswalker has no need of a physical body. Stunned, Capuchin listens as Urza reveals his final gambit in the fight against Yogmoth. Activation of the Legacy Weapon Only through assembling the Legacy, through assembling all that Dominaria stands for, can Yogmoth be defeated. Urza urges Gerard to gather the Legacy at this dire juncture. As its heir, he is the only one capable of unleashing its true potential. When the artifacts are gathered, Urza reveals that his Power Stone eyes, Karn's body, and Gerard's life are also part of the legacy, and they must make an ultimate sacrifice to save Dominaria. Without option, Gerard activates the legacy weapon, and the two men are consumed within its initial blast. Urza's legacy unleashes a sentient beam of pure mana that pierces Yagmoth's very soul. In a moment that will reverberate through history, the Phyrexian god is obliterated and seeing their master destroyed, Phyrexia's army cease fighting. Urza's power stone eyes are fused within Karn's body, and his planeswalker spark is transferred to the silver golem. Though he truly is no more, Urza's memories, convictions, and essence survive in Karn. His spirit can rest knowing that his actions saved cherished Dominaria from succumbing to the Phyrexian machine. In the face of invasion, Urza was able to unite the disparate continents and peoples of Dominaria into the coalition a singular force driven towards a singular goal. Nowhere do we see this better than in cards like Rewards of Diversity and Spirit of Resistance, in which the flavor text states, our victory must come from all of Dominaria, or it will not come. Indeed, all of Dominaria stood united thanks to Urza's machinations, a feat that, despite his life's myriad achievements, might be his greatest accomplishment. But time erodes memory, and even if Urza's legacy is preserved in Karn, Teferi, and others, much of Dominaria forgets the Planeswalker's axe, and once more splits itself into warring factions. Urza's own actions further tear Dominaria apart nearly 300 years after his death, when the Temporal Crisis threatens to sunder the plane completely in 4500 AR. Urza's Silex Blast and Telerian manipulations of the time stream created temporal rifts that culminate in the Time Spiral Crisis, which destabilizes space time and mana ley lines across all of Dominaria. This crisis highlights how much destruction Urza caused his home plane and how much Dominaria had to endure in the name of protection. Again, Urza's actions thread a very fine needle and bring into question whether his means are justified by his ends. It's safe to assume that Urza made preparations in the event of his demise. He knew his death was necessary to ignite the legacy weapon, and his sacrifice required to defeat the god Yagmoth. In his millennia-long war, he cultivated and laid plans to ensure Dominaria's safety in his absence, and to foster its regrowth after countless atrocities suffered at his hands. After all, Urza's legacy is one of violence and devastation. His artifice consumed much of the plane in his war with Mishra. The detonation of the Silex destabilized Dominaria's climate, and his tampering with the time streams nearly rent the very fabric of reality. Urza makes great effort to ensure the path is clear for healing in the centuries after his death. He placed well-hidden clues in a series of artifacts across the continents of Dominaria for his pupil and ally Teferi to uncover. They have the potential to integrate the lost realm of Zalfir back into the time stream, a mistake and failure that Teferi suffers daily. 
Though it's up to speculation, to me, this event is implied in the title of the upcoming Dominaria United set, where the plane isn't just united in ideals, but mended physically as well. Urza has also left behind his greatest creation to act as steward over Dominaria, and protect it in other planes from future strife brought from beyond the blind eternities. The Silver Golem Karn remains the scion of Urza, and in truth part of Urza lives on within the Planeswalker Spark and Power Stone, housed within his metal carapace. Karn realizes the scope of his and his master's failure when the metallic plane of Mirrodin is corrupted by glistening oil and transformed into a new Phyrexia. Yogmoth's defeat wasn't the end of Phyrexia, and Karn nearly succumbed to their expansion. It's right for the progeny of Urza, Phyrexia's most vehement opposition, to confront the next generation and the latest Phyrexian threat. The Silver Golem has assumed the mantle of Defender of Dominaria and Liberator of Mirrodin. In his quest to eradicate Phyrexia, Karn seeks allies in power to strike a lethal blow before they are prepared to launch another invasion. A remnant of Urza is buried beneath the undergrowth of Yavamaya Forest, a weapon used long ago in the climactic battle of the Brothers' War. Karn seeks the Golgothian Silex, a weapon capable of reducing continents to ash and unleashing devastating surges of mana to cleanse Mirrodin of its Phyrexian infection. The Silex has been used once before against the armies of Phyrexia. One can only hope that in this time they've not developed new methods of countering such destruction. The art of the card Triumphant Reckoning illustrates several planeswalkers arriving on a beleaguered world, with Karn among them. Perhaps this is a moment in the future when the allies of the multiverse band together and assault new Phyrexia. Perhaps Urza's greatest legacy is his history. Several sagas depict Urza's actions and the events he's caused throughout Dominaria's past. It shows how memorable a figure he is when tales of the Brothers' War that ravaged Terrassier are still told nearly 4,500 years later. We see this in the saga The Antiquities War, where Urza's and Mishra's struggle is related. The flavor text of Nature's Spiral highlights an excerpt from the tome and states, As Argoth's last defenders fell to Urza's juggernauts, Titania said, Nature cannot be destroyed, only changed. He is known through the ages as a despoiler of the land, indifferent towards the lives he ruins or ends. But he's remembered by some as an ingenious artificer, a messiah that brought forth salvation from the darkness. Many detest him, some revere him, but it's without question that the name of Urza Planeswalker continues to drift on the Dominarian breeze. Pieces of Urza's legacy weapon have also survived their creator, and so have those individuals who could at least call Urza a companion, if not a friend. The skyship Weatherlight continues to soar above Dominaria's continents, with the artificer Joyra acting as captain, a woman of Shiv who had worked with Urza since the founding of the Telerian Academy. Raf Capuchin, the Weatherlight's mage, is a member of Clan Capuchin, the Banalish family involved in Urza's bloodline project to create the inheritor of the legacy. As mentioned before, Karn, perhaps the most influential component of the legacy, also survives his creator and carries on Urza's fight against Phyrexia. And Teferi, the chronomancer from Zalfir, is one with intimate knowledge of Urza Planeswalker. He has first-hand experience with Urza's obstinance, moral ambiguity, betrayal, and redemption. Though the High Artificer casts a long shadow across all their lives, Urza left a lasting impression on these brilliant minds that has shaped them into what they are today, and they'll carry his torch to illuminate the multiverse's grim future. The echoes of Urza's legacy reverberate through Dominaria's history and rattle the crumbling metal ruins dotting the landscape. His personal crusade against the Phyrexians and their god left Urza's home plane war-torn, stripped of mana, and on the brink of collapse. But his legacy was successful, and his deeds, heroic or vile, have been passed down for centuries and will continue to be recounted. Dominaria has since recovered from the mana blights of the time spiral crisis and from the devastation of invasion. We see nature seek to reclaim what it had lost as new growth covers Urza's Delerict war machines and towns once ravaged by war are being resettled across the plain. And even across the blind eternities, we see the fallout of Urza's plans and his lasting legacy in the fight against Phyrexia. Karn, Urza's metal progeny, is poised to fight once more against the horrors of a new Phyrexia on the rise. The centuries haven't dulled Karn's memory of Phyrexian atrocities that nearly consumed his home plane, and he won't rest until the multiverse is cleansed of their corruption. 
he's taken the mantle of his creator and follows in Urza's footsteps. Our only hope is that he can strike swiftly before billions more perish under the weight of a new father of machines. Though Urza is no more, the memories of his genius, his hubris, and his resolve remain hidden just beneath the surface of a recovering Dominaria, begging to be rediscovered by those drawn to unspeakable power. Thank you so much for watching and listening to this video on Urza Planeswalker. Now I want to hear from you. Let me know your thoughts about Urza. Is he a hero or a villain? Were his actions just, and what could he have done differently in his quest to thwart Phyrexia? And if you're a fan of lore and storytelling, consider subscribing to the channel or checking out the podcast where content is uploaded frequently. Again, a huge shout out to all of my Patreon supporters who make all of this possible. I couldn't do it without their spectacular patronage. If you're interested in becoming a lore luminary for access to me, written scripts, and early video drops, check out the link below or head to patreon.com slash librarians to learn more. Special thanks to script editor Kenan Orhan. Until next time, go forth and explore the lore.